Hi, all. I'm Rob Carrington, the founder, CEO, and chief creator of Amazing Ideas at Stunning Digital Marketing. In today's podcast, I welcome back friend of the show, Mr. Jeff Brown. And what Jeff and I are going to talk about through Jeff's experiences over the last couple months during COVID-19 is lessons learned while teaching online. This episode is one you don't want to miss, so sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the conversation between myself and Jeff Brown. Hey everybody, Rob Cairns here. I'm here with my friend, Mr. Jeff Brown. Jeff is a workplace education trainer And today I thought Jeff and I would revisit the whole uh, teaching from home, uh, teaching online, and that whole thing since Jeff's been doing it for a couple months now at least. How are you today, Jeff? We're doing good, Rob, and we're still in the midst of continuing to do workplace education training, even in the summer months. Yeah, it it doesn't seem to end, does it, really? No, the, and the need is it's never been greater for businesses to learn how to work online, how to work safely online, how to use all the different <laughs> types of uh, applications to get strong in their social media, to design better websites uh, and websites that they may not even have in the first place, for instance. Workplace yeah. education, these are some of the things that it handles. Yeah, and you guys in Nova Scotia do things in a bit of a different way than a lot of areas of the country. I know in Toronto. Absolutely. We have a we have a big entrepreneurs group, but you guys have a model that nobody else really replicates successfully. No. The Manitoba was uh they had a model somewhat similar, but they changed it. So really uh Nova Scotia is uh, effectively the only place in the world that I'm aware of that runs this current model and it involves heavily around partnership. Now that's funny. Usually it's my dogs you know, interfering with recordings and uh, <laughs> I know, I know. The pros are working from home. So for about four months ago back in March you pivoted to running Zoom and we you and I did a discussion I guess about a couple of months ago about working and and teaching from home and now that we've been doing it for a while I thought it was worth revisiting this whole topic and doing a lessons learned what's the biggest lesson you've learned from teaching from home on zoom all day the the biggest challenge is to uh, the biggest lesson is to make sure you keep your participants engaged it's not just giving a lecture and they're making notes it is to engage people uh and make sure that they are involved in the learning and that there's a real transfer of skills and some sort of a way of measuring how that transference of skills is actually happening. That's the biggest challenge because if we're going to put the time in, we need to make sure at the end that people have achieved, they've gotten these skills and they can actually function in these skills. And that's extremely important. Yeah. There's enough courses where people have had Taking courses, they've got binders, they're on shelves, they went, that was great, but hey, it didn't change anything in how they run their ship, so to speak. And mm-hmm. workplace education very much changes and transforms how people do business and how they function and, and deploy these new skills. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people, I call them professional students. They take course after course after course, so if you can toss them on a resume, and then I kind of look at them and say, okay, what did you implement from this course? Oh, I took the next course. Well, frankly, if you're doing that, there's no point in taking those courses, in my opinion. I think you need to take courses and implement one or two Absolutely. skills that you've learned and, and stop taking more courses till you've implemented what you already know, like personally. Yeah. And one of the parts of the workplace education program is at the very last class is the closing. We're workplace education coordinators and all the partners from the project team. And these are people that are sponsoring it, uh, could be the host of the, of a chamber or a business organization and everybody else in the community that's on that project team, they get together and they get to hear this, the great success stories that the participants share and how 
they are now using these new skills. Mm -hmm. And um, I received uh, one letter that it almost brought me to tears. Uh, a woman literally said that uh, she would not be in business today if it wasn't for the skills that she had learned uh, from workplace education and specifically a few of the courses that I taught. And it really, um, instructors want to matter. They really want to make sure that uh, what they're teaching is valuable, not just fluff. And right. when we get letters like that, that's so heartwarming. It just shows that we are actually achieving what we hope uh, when we set out. Yeah, that's so true. Um, let's talk as an instructor energy level. And this is something you and I have talked about offline. I live in a world of Zoom meetings these days. You live in a world of Zoom chats online and with your students. Um, in terms of energy level, what do you okay. think about that and teaching well, online? All let's put it in perspective. I now have over 8,040 hours of program delivery since 2007. So a lot of it has been in class. And I've taught a lot of classes per quarter, if you want to call it that. And I know what it likes. I know what it's like to run a class inside when you've got participants in the room. But when it comes to Zoom, the level of energy expended is much greater because it's almost like the instructor is not only the instructor, but he's the entertainer. He's the person that is uh, making the conversations happen. And literally, uh, at the end of the week, when I've done probably seven or eight workplace education programs, and these are four hours, oh, each program is four hours a week, three and a half to four hours a week, yep. I'm literally just beat by the end of the week. Yeah. It is high demand, and you always have to be up. You've got to be the one that uh, spurs everybody forward into the learning. And yep. that's a very draining uh, I, I enjoy what I do, don't get me wrong, but there's a cost to um, being an online instructor. It is very draining. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple of days I know where I've done eight hours or seven hours of Zoom calls in one day. And you get off those calls and I just feel I'm baked. Um, I would suggest to a lot of people, a couple of things you can do. One, keep a bottle of water beside you being hydrated when you're on online calls is I find it's even harder Two, if you're on a three hour call and you're running that call, make sure you schedule a couple of bathroom breaks in the middle. Absolutely. Of um, three, I try to avoid back to backs. So one of the things you and I were talking about last night offline was what do I do back to back? And what I usually do is reboot my laptop because I like my resources clean. Uh, I'm finding that's a problem. And frankly, I take my puppies out <laughs> because the little monsters need to get outside. And absolutely, it's a, it's a good breather, but you got to take care of yourself. It's not easy. And, and by the way, because you're on the all day Zoom calls, if you are, that doesn't mean you skip lunch and that doesn't mean you skip dinner. You need to make sure you get your breaks in no matter what you do somehow. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, um, I could literally put in uh, 32 hours of class time per mm. week. And some of these classes literally are, you know, morning and afternoon. You've got to take care of yourself as an instructor and you've got to um, watch how much energy you expend. And, and it's, I always arrive early. So I, I want to make sure that yep. participants have had questions. I want to check in with them and to see how they're doing. I've had some amazing stories of uh, some participants that came in. One, her mother had just died. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was pressing ahead, and we had a discussion. And she hadn't even gone through the grieving process. And yep. so I like these check-in processes to find out where people are at and what I need to do to help them to get into the learning mode. Mm -hmm. And always, there's always questions after class and then questions before the next class, so to speak. So yep. Yep. as an instructor, you've got to guard your time between classes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that, that balance of making sure that everybody's getting what they need to be successful. Yeah. And now you're teaching mostly adults. One of the suggestions I would make to anybody teaching youth, so we're talking pre-high school kids, yep. 
is when you jump on these Zoom calls with your students, give them 10 minutes to get their chit chat out of the way, their stuff out of the way. You got to remember they're stuck at home as well. And, you know, it's even harder for some of the youth. So give them, you know, some yeah. time and let them get it out of the way. Because if you do, um, your class will run much smoother. I, I think the other thing you need to do too, and we've kind of talked about with Zoom with all the changes. Um, we've been talking a little bit about Google Meet and the changes they're putting in there. I think you got to be aware of how to use your software. And one of the biggest things is how do you mute, unmute? How do you kill somebody's video? And in a worst case scenario, how do you kick somebody out of the discussion if it goes that far? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's where, as an instructor, you have to know um, the program you're using inside and out. You have to understand the limitations. You have to understand the technical aspects of it. For instance, Zoom, for instance, is very resource heavy, rebooting between um, classes just to get a fresh start. Um, yeah. it's, I find that... Uh, if I don't throughout the day, I'm starting to get some Zoom issues with um, freezing, some, you know, beyond the typical bugs yeah. that would come from Zoom, it's because of the resources. And I generally um, have a machine that's pretty much a resource, high in memory, high in uh, clock speed, high in high quality hard, SSD hard drives to make sure that at the end of it, and to make sure that, um, my internet is the best that it can be. Those are the things that instructors have to focus on, especially upload speed, because you're sharing files. You want to make sure that they get those files when they need, otherwise the class is being held up by, until someone can open up that file. Yep. And you have to be aware of just, if something doesn't work at that moment, you have to know a workaround right away. You gotta have a plan B and a plan C when you're instructing online. No question. No question. And one thing I want to go back to, you touched on is the internet. I think where we need to get, and parents aren't going to want to hear me say this, colleagues aren't going to want me here to say this, but going out and getting the cheapest internet your provider can provide in the area you're in is actually doing you, your business, your kids a disservice right now or anytime because there's more people at home you're sharing bandwidth amongst multiple people in a house. And frankly, at the end of the day, um, if you don't have good internet, you know, and I mean, really good internet, how can you function anymore? So I think the days of people saying to Rogers or Bell or tell us, give me the cheapest internet on your block. I think those days are long gone, actually. Absolutely. And another thing that you got to also think about whether you're a teaching or you're a participant is ergonomics, having a great chair, have your monitors set up in a place, and I'm a big believer, and I've seen this in workplace education, uh, dual monitors, one for Zoom and one for whatever you're working in. That way mm -hmm. you're not flipping one screen behind the other and potentially um, losing the original teachable moment because you forgot between flipping screens, for example. So dual monitors, having your environment so it's comfortable. And, and as an instructor, I like to create an environment where people, they gotta go use the washroom, they can get up and go. They just feel um, that they can. And it's so important to make sure that you engage people because this helps the time pass better. Yep. It's not all about you chatting and lecturing, so to speak. It's about everybody partnering together in the learning and your environment that your um, learning in is very important to the process of having a great Zoom or online meeting period. And by the way, if you got to get up and go, do us all a favor and kill your video when you do it. Like, you know, a lot of people just get up and go and don't kill the video. It's one thing if you're chatting with a friend and say, give me a minute. But if you're on a conference call, just show it or respect. Kill the video. Kill Absolutely. The video. And the audio too, just in case uh, when you press the... Uh, the flush mode you don't yeah. hear that going down oh i've heard that going down <laughs> oh. and 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 the worst one is the one that has to sit with a bag of potato chips in the middle of the meeting and 
or the class and lose the audio on it's like oh God. yeah so we really one, gotta... one important thing about um meetings uh from an instructor's perspective is i need to see participant videos yeah, yeah. i need to see facial expressions i need to see Agree. Um, because I can tell whether participants are learning or not simply by their facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And so that's so important for me keeping up to speed so I know that I can move on to the next topic that we're, we're learning in, in that particular class day. Yep. Yep. And, and I think, I think it's okay. Like you just got to work with your students and, and one of the, the pearls of getting online is and doing all these meetings is helping the students and i do things where i always say to my clients make sure you've done your windows updates before the meeting please absolutely i've, I've, I've had uh clients believe it or not where all of a sudden they go poof and it's because of a windows update and it's like why didn't you just schedule it and do it ahead of time that's number yeah. one. Number two is, as I say, reboot your machine on a regular basis. I don't think once a day is good enough anymore, personally. But that's just me. I'm a little anal that way, and I, I know that. Number three, um, try and find a quiet space. And um, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. People get interrupted. You got to sort of manage the people who live around you and say, wait a minute. I'm working today. I'm taking a class today. Please let me do my work and support them because they've all got issues. And number four, I don't think, you know, the place to take a meeting is on your phone. Um, it's not necessarily bad on a tablet. Um, and I'll give a tip out there. If you're having problems getting a web camera right now, many people don't know this. The new Fire 8 tablet by Amazon, the HD tablet, um, there is a Zoom app in the Amazon store and it has a camera built in. So that could be an alternative for some people, but if yeah. you don't have a good web camera, trying to get one right now is almost impossible. Yes. And one of the things that we've discussed early on um, when we were making this transition is that we're not doing Zoom meetings via the phone because the screen is just too small to be able to read and, and, and observe what's happening. So the transfer of information really needs to happen on a good size screen, whether it's a tablet or a desktop screen. Uh, people need to be able to see stuff before they can do stuff. And a phone I, is way too small. I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with you. I, don't, I know people who try to do it, and I just shake my head every time. And, and it also tells me, from my perspective, as somebody who runs a lot of meetings, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, is maybe they're not putting the thought and the effort into it. And that to me is a concern too. Like if you can't sit down at a, a desktop for an hour, should you be there? <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. Because if, if you plan to learn, if you plan to get these skills, you have to do everything you need to do to make sure that there's a transfer of knowledge, yeah. which means that you need to accommodate yourself so you can see it, hear it, uh, it's not time. I mean, at the end of the day, there are people that uh, in their business plan to succeed. And there are people that literally plan to sabotage their business because they don't really want the, the pain of growing. Yeah. And so um, if you're going to want your business to grow, you need to prepare ahead to make sure that you're doing everything you can. You're buying the right gear. You're getting everything you need to uh, get the job done. So true. And including buying the right gear, especially with online meetings, is audio. And I know people are stuck right now. So there's a lot of people using like internal microphones, microphones built into cameras. I would suggest to anybody that's doing online meetings all day for learning is go get yourself a good microphone. And that might mean a headset. I often use a headset that's comfortable with a mic. It's yeah. easy. Uh, today I'm using a new mic and I'm using earbuds, but do something like, don't just say, Oh, the internal stuff is good enough. Cause honestly, it's really not. And, uh, that's a problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, and you had a chance, Rob, to sit into several of my workplace education programs. What were some of the things as an outsider coming in, 
what did you take away as learning nuggets for you? One of the things I like is at the start of every every call, you do a, um, a round table. So you go across and say, okay, where are you at this week? And you do it with everybody there so everybody could learn. Um, the other thing you do really well, Jeff, is you don't do all the demoing. You'll get students to share a screen and show what they're doing because you think their work is just important. And then, and then other people will jump in and say, did you try this? Did you do this? Did you do that? I think that's most helpful. And I think the other thing is just managing the conversation flow, right? So, I mean, if you don't manage that and it goes south, it goes south pretty quick. And I'm a big one of managing the conversation flow and trying to keep things going. So that's, that's yeah. three big things. You bring an interesting point up because one of the things that people have discovered the beauty of online learning is that they actually, when someone has a problem, everybody gets to see the problem screen and there's a great learning moment from that. Mm -hmm. Had we been in the classroom, uh, that individual's computer would it maybe be available for the person beside them, but not on the other side of the table. And people are, um, these learning moments where I don't know where to go, I don't know how this works, become great learning moments for everybody on the Zoom meeting. And yeah, this is one of the things that uh, they have discovered that is um, better than what they thought. The other thing that's better with the thought and, you know, my take on this kind of stuff is if you get somebody who's crunched for time in their business or their life and they're doing an online learning program, they're not spending an hour to get there and an hour to get home. I, yeah. I, know, I know I've taken courses from a trainer in Toronto, shout out to Paul Toby and his team, and they offered them both ways. They offered them either in their studio or online. And I, I generally preferred to be there, but the state of the world doesn't allow us to do that right now. So. Absolutely. So I think, I think that's, that's what people need to realize. I miss that interaction personally. But. And I love to, because if the, part of workplace education, and I always try to make sure this happens, is the networking aspect of it. Your businesses are interacting with other businesses, getting each other's emails, and building a strong strategic alliance with other businesses in that area. Yeah, we, we've done that where we'll, we've taken one of your classes together and you'll go around the room and say, okay, let's talk about your business. And we've spent a couple minutes with each person doing that on purpose to sort of. That was incredibly invaluable for them. They often rave about how great that experience was. Because yeah. at the end of the day, uh, an online Zoom meeting allows me to bring in a uh, expert in a specific field Mm -hmm. that allows extra impact to happen for the learning. Yeah. Yep. And that's, I'm always appreciative of people that I bring in that uh, bring extra value and extra expertise. Because yep. at the end of the day, Rob, you and I very much think a lot alike in how we train. We do. And so it's almost like I start a sentence, you finish it. And that's only because... You know, you and I have known each other other over the years. We talk continually about uh, where things are going, and these our conversations end up in workplace education training, maybe six months down the road, as we begin to uh, flesh out our uh, discussions. Yeah, no kidding. One of the one of the things I like so much when when I'm brought in is being able to just help them and give them a viewpoint and say, "Hey, guys." It's not that bad. It's really not. And, and sort of give them a couple of tips to say, this is how you can do it. And, and I think what helps is I'm out there doing it with people every day. So I can take experiences and say, this works, this doesn't work. This worked six months ago. It won't work today. You know, that kind of discussion. And I, Absolutely. Think, that, I think that's really, really, really important, actually. To be honest. Yeah. So the other tip I want to toss out there, just because you and I have talked about this one. Let's talk about when you're running a meeting and you're sharing screens. And I think I've told you a couple of times offline, one of my favorite tips is if I'm doing a meeting where I'm doing heavy presenting, 
I'll actually join the meeting as a second person on a second laptop and I'll run sharing my screen off that laptop, not off my main one. And that means if something happens and that share screen locks up, I can actually boot it and still take control of the meeting and manage the meeting. What do you think about tips like that? Well, last week that happened where um, I think I had a video uh, driver issue. I was in That's, that class. <laughs> and um, it literally, um, this, ha this was another one too, Rob. And I, I had a, my laptop on standby to uh, stay in the meeting. Yeah, and that made all the difference between the uh, meeting or the, the training going forward or stopping. Yeah, yeah. And we know that there are external stuff that happens that we have no control over. But mm -hmm. if you're smart, having the ability to have a backup resource to keep things rolling. Yeah. So so true. Um, and, and lighting is a big part of these meetings too. Like people, both you and I today are in well-lit rooms, which helps. Um, one of the things I would suggest to anybody, if you have the opportunity, put your computer looking out the window, not the window behind you. I've had to do that before for reasons of just aesthetics of the room and it's awful. Like if you can get the window in front of you, you're much yep. better off that way. Um, I would also suggest anybody if they're having problems with lighting, get some good LED lights. They work really well in the room. They're not expensive. So, you know, things like that help, especially at night. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, um, your business face that you put out on uh, Zoom, for example, that literally is your business. So yeah. how are you planning to show up? Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's like stepping up to bat we always step up to bat to do our very best and we want to put our business across in a very professional manner it doesn't mean that we absolutely have to be perfect all the time but you know we need to be trying yeah it's true I, and I think people are more tolerant with people being at home and adjusting to their life but you still got to be reasonable like you know, if somebody's dog barks and you have had it happen today, I can't tell you the number of times one of my dogs has shown up in the middle of a meeting. You just got to kill the sound and move on kind of thing. I mean, it's just like, let's not dwell on stuff that we can't prevent and work on the stuff we can. Right? Absolutely. And, um, the other thing I would throw out there, and this is just something about whether it's online teaching or offline teaching and more for students is make a point of reviewing your material before you go to class the next week. So if somebody covers say WordPress, um, Google analytics for WordPress, make sure you review that and play with it a little bit. So you go in a class the next week with a more better understanding and you can actually ask the questions you need to ask to get help. Absolutely. And I try to, as much as possible, have the notes available before the class, the new notes. That way they get a chance to print them off if they want to print them off. But a, ch a chance to begin to make notes because I want participants not only just to listen, but actually write down because the learning that they'll retain more information if they write it down as they're working along. And I try to make sure I don't go too fast because I'm always trying to get input and feedback from them. How are they doing? Are they okay at a certain stage? Are we ready to move? Because at the end of the day, there's not a truckload of content that I have to deliver. I need to make sure that skills are being transferred. Yeah. And so if I don't get to the end of the bus, so to speak, of content delivery, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. If I get them more functional when they came in, and I don't have usually a problem with that, um, that's, the big thing for me because I want businesses to be stronger businesses being able to be more effective in what they need to do. And because of that effectiveness, they're saving time. Maybe they're a um, little less stressed. Maybe they're able to do more things. Maybe the, their employer, because I often have a lot of employees in these programs, not just business owners. Um, they're able to do more and because they can do more, they help the business owner do more. Mm -hmm. sure, so, sure. A lot of great wins for everybody when it comes to workplace education. Now, now you've been using um, Google Classroom as a uh, 
as in a classroom, the manager classrooms, how has that gone and how have the participants uh, viewed using Google Classroom? It's been great. The, um, I send the Zoom link out by email, but I also put the Zoom link in Google Classroom. That way, I absolutely make sure that they can join the meeting. Um, they have notes. I can put videos up there if I want them to watch a video to reinforce a skill. There is a stream section where we can interact and comment. They can ask questions on what's being posted. Um, Google Classroom just isn't for school. It is a great business training platform. And there's a lot of uh, different things that I've done with it. Not necessarily hacked it, so to speak, but if we talk about uh, maybe taking it in a different direction that was intended to, to help business do better, uh, we've done that. We, we showed participants how to do that. Yeah, I think, um, and a lot of parents out there are probably very familiar with Google Classroom at this point because many of the schools are using it as they try and get their plans for September back in gear. And I think, um, I think the challenge is going to be, I think most school boards are going to head towards a hybrid solution when I'm hearing this fall. I was just thinking that, Robert, that I would say that um, where we're at right now, we are uh, the whole fabric of business, but also education and training has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, the genie's out of the bottle. We are not going back. No, no. And even if we go back into a classroom kind of a setup or a boardroom setup, there's still going to be room for Zoom. There's still going to be room for um, Google Classroom. Because when you think about it, if, we're, uh, if I'm doing Zoom, even in front of them, they get to see uh, the computer when people are sharing screens. They get to see yeah. the person's screen being shared. These are valuable things that we've discovered that will not be uh, tossed out the window, so to speak. Oh, I, I would agree with you. I think, um, you know, I'm kind of watching it play out with the school boards around the greater Toronto area right now. And TDSB, the Toronto board has come out and said, we're going to put the kids in the classroom five days a week, like it or not. And I'm shaking my head saying, oh, is that a recipe for disaster? And then the Catholic board came out I guess on Friday and said, not only are we going to put the kids in five days a week, we're not going to do any social distancing in our schools whatsoever. And I think, honestly, I think what's going on right now is a big political play to see who steps up to fund what, to do what. I know um, Peel School Board, where I have some people I know, a lot of people I know, they're talking about going to a three on, three off model. So three days in the classroom, split the class in half, so 15 kids in, and then they do um, computer-based learning uh, when they're at home, and the other 15 kids come in the next three days. So you're looking at doing some high, which is a hybrid model. So it's getting very interesting, and COVID is kind of just pushed all this up by months and months and months. Yeah. We're looking at a place where they, they call it the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. Maybe some of the things we're seeing are for the, uh, for the better, so to speak. Because at the end of the day, um, digital skills need to be increased. Um, I still s see uh, business owners and participants struggle with uh, digital devices. Why not have the hybrid model where they're actually um, – working in an environment that they will be working in because uh, despite COVID, uh, the world is changing. We yeah. are not just working in our local areas, we're working farther out, so to speak. We're partnering, we're working uh, with other businesses, not in our region, but farther out. Yeah. And the digital um, allows us to work globally and create greater opportunities and to participate in more opportunities that we might not otherwise have. Why not raise our kids to be able to work in that type of an environment regardless of what they do? Oh, I, w I would agree with that. And one thing I would suggest is if anybody in Canada or the U.S. is thinking about moving into a rural location saying, oh, I can work from home. I can, my kids can learn from home. Don't do it right now because 
truthfully, the rural locations don't have the internet access that is fast enough to be able to sustain your life. And you need to really think about that. I mean, I read an article, I guess yesterday or the day before, that said the Canadian government is about to step in and mandate minimum speeds. I have um, an uncle who lives in Bath, Ontario, which for those who don't know is about 35 minutes out of Kingston. And he's on microwave service, <laughs> believe it or not, because he's rural. He's right by yeah. the lake. And his provider uh, two, months more in, two months ago in COVID actually tripled his internet speed by microwave. Those who don't know, microwave is basically point-to-point -point internet. It's done by a series of towers. And I think we're going to get to a point where the government's about to finally take broadband, high-speed internet, as serious as power, hydro, and the phone lines. I think we're there. I hope we are. Yeah, some we, of the, uh, what they call high-speed in some areas, like when the wind blows, people lose their internet for days. That's not high-speed. That is. And some of the internet that I've seen, and I've traveled through Nova Scotia and a lot of places, some of the things they call high-speed internet is not high-speed. I can't believe how it ever qualified as high speed it's some places is not even as good as dial up no i know and you know my mom has that issue at the cottage it's not as fast i know from experience when uh joe's parents were up north my wife's parents um they had dsl that was like dsl that we got in the city like 30 years ago and yeah. i'm like i would just cringe and at that and just say, really? So I think we're getting to the point, I hear rumblings where the government is about to step in and mandate stuff eventually. I think it's, it's at that point. But I also think we just need to keep working with it. And, and frankly, one of the things we have to watch with everybody working at home is that you get away from the screen time. And that means the computer, the TV, the other stuff, and take a break once in a while. Because my screen time is always high. Yours is always high because of what we do. But we got to be very, very careful that you don't go from necessarily working all day in front of a screen to watching TV all night to, to vice versa. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, um, your social skills need to be developed because you need to go out and talk to people. Yep. When you're watching TV, you're not, a lot of times you're not conversing, you're not interacting, you're just zo uh, zoning out, so to speak. Yep. And so as much as I love the online, um, developing great uh, personal connections with people face-to-face -face is very important. And you do have to have your own support network, so to speak, yep. through right. this whole process. And go read a book, and I don't mean a Kindle book, like an actual <coughs> actual book once in a while, and just change your method of learning and relaxing, and that helps too. It really does. Absolutely, because you, uh, when we train online, we're always operating at an extremely high level to deliver great training. Yep. And you can't sustain that level of activity um, all the time you've got to come down and you've got to rest your brain you've got to be able to lower your heart rate you, it's you got to take care of your health so to speak and that means just get unplugging um making sure that you just have time to do nothing that means nothing is not watching tv it's just maybe out on, the, on your deck for instance do, uh, do what i do and go, and go for a five kilometer walk every day and if you don't, if that doesn't work, there's a really cool meditation app. And I'm not a big meditator, but I have friends that are called Calm. You might have heard of C-A-L-M. Yeah. It's about $80 a year. And I think if that helps you rejig and feel better, I think it's truthfully $80 well spent, to be honest with you. There's a couple other apps out there. Um, don't be afraid to use them. Like you got to You got to take care of yourself even more. Uh, Jeff, if you've got three real good tips to participants joining an online teaching uh, course, what would you suggest? First one would be have two monitors. Yep. The, this fighting and flipping screens yep. is a more of a distraction than a help. Um, 
making sure that you check your computer before you go online. Make sure, I mean, literally, um, this uh, Microsoft uh, 2004 update, it sent both of my, uh, my laptop, my desktop to the um, repair store. And look after your devices because that's how you're going to work. Um, have, have a good device. Um, come to the party well prepared as far as your equipment. If you're gonna learn, Make sure you've got good gear. I know budgets come into play, but being on old computers, like an old Windows 7 computer or an XP computer, that is not good. And you want to make sure that as much as possible, you can get it, a good webcam. It has a good mic in it or some sort of a uh, microphone that you can have in earbuds. I like mm -hmm. earbuds, and I've got a good mic on my webcam. But I've also looked at... Uh, uh, something similar to you with the boom mic. Yeah. I'm also looking into that. And again, the question is, can you get it nowadays? But my, that's so, so can you get it just for interest sake? So back in April, my wife said to me, you're going to order a new webcam. You can order a new mic. You'll never get them. And I said, I know. So what I'll do is I will order them from China direct. And, you know, I had a friend who you know, I'll share this, said, oh, you're ordering from China. And I said, where do you think all your other electronic stuff is coming from? <laughs> yeah. China. So yeah. the, big, the big difference was I did the homework and I ordered um, what was the equivalent to the Logitech 920C webcam. And then I did the equivalent to what was the top, um, one of the top boom mics but I did them without the brand name stamp on it. So for those who don't know, a lot of stuff comes out of warehouses and they're just stamped. Logitech, Panasonic, you know, the old joke in candy used to be, if you bought an old Eaton's TV, for those old enough to remember Eaton's, the Viking brands were the same brands that uh, other brands had right next to them, except with the Viking stamp on them, right? So, Absolutely. and honestly, it took, just under three months to get stuff and if i'd ordered on amazon i'd still be waiting so sometimes doing your homework and going to source if you can deal with it is sometimes worth it too so but i agree get a good camera get a good mic i like the boom mic because you can adjust it and move it it also comes with a pop filter which is really really handy but you know and the other thing too is have a good space to train in and yeah. that means that you may have to partner with your family to um, make sure that they uh, give you the best opportunity to learn they're yeah. not banging on the door they're not or or do or doing office work i mean yeah. i i have to admit we we've gone through some challenges at home where my wife's daughters moved in and I've moved my office actually into my master bedroom, God forbid. And people say, does that work? And I said, well, we don't really use it during the day. So it works, but you just got to train your family that when you're working or training, you're, you're working or training. And that's a big problem in a lot of households. A lot of family don't have that respect. And both my wife and I do conference calls. So yeah. we, we get it, but in some houses it's a, it's a problem. And also set your expectations with your friends too. Just because you're at home learning or working doesn't mean you're available and you got to draw that line. It was one of the hardest things I did 10 years ago was say to people, I know I'm at home at 10 o'clock, but that doesn't mean I'm available to talk to you. Right? So. Absolutely. And another thing that I've discovered is that um, people, well, when they work in an office setting, when they work home, they're actually working. But one of the challenges that they have to remember is now that they're home, they have to watch because people are tending to work more at home than they are in the office. They yep. need to have a clear, defined cutoff time and make that distinction between this room is the office. When I step outside of it, I'm home and the two don't as much as possible. Um, and, take, and, take, and take your breaks. I know when we're done recording today, I'm going for a walk. So take your breaks, look after yourself. You might have to be a little more flexible working from home because of noise, partners, kids, whatever you got to do. But 
I think that's the new normal. And absolutely, uh, I truly, I truly believe that what we're going to see is we're actually going to see a glut of commercial real estate on the market very soon because these companies are going to realize it's cheaper to pay for somebody's internet connection at home than pay for their cubicle space in an office tower. Yeah. Home. Now, one of the things that uh, there's talk around, it's still unfolding, is if I work in an office setting, uh, I'm covered by my, my employer's insurance. The yeah. question then becomes, when I'm at home, am I covered or not? And that has to do with um, maybe workplace injuries, for instance, where you're at work, it's a workplace injury. Is it at home you're working? Is it a workplace mm -hmm. injury, for instance? I, and I think you really got to look at what your home insurance policy covers and doesn't cover. I mean, oh, yeah. you and I are in different spots. Where we, we have business insurance, but a lot of people, and even a lot of people work at home don't even think that way. It's a, it's a problem. Yeah. yeah and the other, the, the other discussion now kicking around and, you know, it wasn't really what we're talking about, but since we are going down that road, is there's discussion that if, if a worker, say, would have worked out of an office building in Chicago, decides to move to a rural town, do we pay him as much because the cost of living dropped and should that be tied to his salary? And that discussion is going on too. And it's it's yeah. not a real, a real good one, but you know, well, I the, think this COVID has brought in a lot of interesting uh, conversations now, and literally, uh, it, it's as simple as: Do I need to have my employees in an office building, or can we use things like Zoom and have meetings and have them do the work in their environment and work that way? Because that is, there are new discussions around that is. There are people that are never going going to go back to off the office. It just yeah. isn't going to happen because the employer said, "Hey, I got an office. I don't need." That means heat, uh, space, yeah. rent. That's a savings for me. And so, how do we tie it, that together? The other thing I would be I'd be very careful of is if you're in an educational environment where you're on Zoom calls and you're trying to learn, don't get wrapped up into having web browsers open where you're distracted and looking at recipes. Don't get caught in Slack conversations. Don't get caught in text message conversations with friends while you're trying to learn. Like, honestly, you've got to focus. And this is a problem for a lot of people. They get distracted. So in my business, I'm not a fan of Slack. I'm not a fan of Microsoft Teams. And people always say to me, why? Then people can get you immediately. Well, guess what, folks? I don't want people to get me immediately. Um, you have to plan your day. So one, one of the things I do is I check email a couple of times a day. I don't, I'm not a slave to the email. I'm not a slave to the device. If you got work to do, you got work to do. I mean, it's absolutely. Just, or training to do or anything else. And you got to focus when you're training. So don't get caught. Your friend, your friend, Mary, who texts you and is worried about the Christmas party on Saturday night. Don't get caught talking to Mary in text while you're learning from Jeff. Focus on Jeff and learn the best you can learn. And, and people don't have a tough time with that concept. Yeah, it's we're not as great multitaskers as we thought no we are so. we, we are surely not and um and we they have proven in studies time and time again that when you check out of a task and come back into that task use 10 to 20 minutes on each side so if you're on a course say with you and you get involved in your little text message conversation with mary you can write off 20 minutes and that's what people don't get. The brain doesn't just switch on a dime, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, Jeff, thanks for joining me today. If somebody needs to get a hold of you, how's the best way? Best way they can email me at jbrown at alpha, A-L-P-H-A, socialmediainc.com. And we can begin the conversation from there. Yeah, and, and, and get in the conversations. If anybody needs any help, they can reach out to Jeff. They can reach out to me on social media. I mean, we're both around most of the time. And let's be part of those conversations, not part of the, the negative uh, 
uh, aspect of it all. Like, let's just, Absolutely. Let's just keep being, helping each other. Um, have a great day, everybody, and be safe. Thanks, Neil. Yeah. Thank you to Jeff Brown for joining me on this week's podcast. I hope you learned as much after a conversation between Jeff and myself as I did when we had it. If I can help you in any way, please tweet at me on Twitter, at Rob Cairns. If you'd like to email me, VIP at stunningdigitalmarketing.com or run on over to our website, stunningdigitalmarketing.com and I'd be glad to help you out in any way I can. If you scroll down to the middle of the front page, we are still offering free consults to help businesses and people during COVID-19. You can feel free to Sign up for one, no credit card required. Just book into my calendar. I'd be glad to help you out. Sit down and let's make some things happen. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe during this time. Please, if you're going out and going into an indoor establishment, wear a mask and protect yourself and protect others. As always, this podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. I miss you, Dad, very much. And Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars and make your business succeed. Have a great day, everybody. Bye for now.